continue now in the 18th century. We've already um, looked at the background really and uh, looked at the various movements of God which were instrumental in bringing about the revival. And so now we come to look at some of the main figures. In fact, we'll only have time really to look at the three principal figures, Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley, but uh, we'll start to take a brief glance at them now for our next part uh, in this uh, account of the 18th century revival. Now, perhaps uh, we could say that um, over the years, uh, various writers on this subject of Whitfield, Charles, John and Charles Wesley have uh, perhaps uh, tried to uh, show the divisions that existed between them and uh, pitting one man against the other and trying to arrange them in various orders of merit and comparison and, and so on. Well, um, I'm not uh, attempting to do that. I don't want to do that uh, at all because uh, in the providence of God, they all were brought at that same time and by and large worked together in a very wonderful way and um, we're not here to uh, find faults or anything of that nature. Well, we could begin like this with Whitfield because undoubtedly Whitfield was the first in the field and um, somebody said clothed with apostolic a likeness of apostolic authority he sounded the trumpet voice which hailed the dawn of the great spiritual awakening so that's quite a quite a claim but uh, a great element of truth in that with the likeness of apostolic authority he sounded the trumpet voice which hailed the dawn of the great spiritual awakening of that century and others have said it put it like this they've said his role was one of a spiritual spiritual Hercules lifting his nation from the very pit of hell to the light and liberty of the gospel day and how we need somebody to do a similar thing today. Now Whitfield, his character was one of a, of a pioneer, of an innovator, of an energizer. He was a man of tremendous energy. In fact, it's why he, he, he burned himself out, literally, uh, in his life, as did uh, the others in, to a degree. But it was certainly Whitfield that set the tone and uh, sounded the theme note, if you like, uh, of, the, of the revival, that is, salvation by grace alone through faith in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. F.W. Borum, who uh, we don't always uh, realise is quite valuable in some of these historical accounts that he gives of great men and women whom God has used, uh, put it like this. Speaking of Whitfield, he said, without Whitfield, it is doubtful whether there would have been any revival at all. Humanly speaking, this is. If Whitfield had been other than he was, the master evangelist of all time, and if he had not discovered the grace and audacity to initiate out of church preaching that was bringing the gospel into the open air and freed it from the artificialities and intolerable stuffiness of a dull and dead ecclesiasticism and made it again part of the vital experience of mankind well uh, there would have been no revival and uh, it, it's certainly that uh, Whitfield was a great shaker of things, a great man in the hands of God, a trumpet voice indeed. Now, um, just turning uh, for a moment to Wesley at this beginning, uh, his part in the work. Now, uh, we usually say that uh, Whitfield was, as we've just said, the, the, the great um, influence, the, the, the great energy, the great pioneer. Uh, of the work uh, and uh, I would say I'm sure most would agree the, the greatest of the two by way as a preacher. Wesley is usually portrayed uh, as a man of uh, organizational flair and he certainly had it. You could uh, commend him for his pastoral wisdom and his uh, genius of organization. Um, Wesley could be called a leader of the revival in the sense that he was able to take hold of the great spiritual energies, if you like, uh, of Whitfield, uh, 
and harness them to uh, a machinery, if we could use that word, that would uh, move things further on and indeed uh, spread that uh, gospel light to the furthest corners of the earth. Uh, he was a great uh, conservator, if you like. He brought the people together in these societies, which eventually became churches. And Wesley was the great planner. So we have the great uh, energizer and moving force and in force and innovator of Whitfield, the great preacher. And then we have the great organizer alongside him, Wesley. Somebody put it like this. Whitfield was no planner. He could gather souls, but he had no scheme for keeping them. Much of his work might well have been undone had not the Wesleys followed up uh, his ministry uh, and uh, kept the people together. Well, that's true. We, we, maybe we're exaggerating a bit here, but uh, that's a good way, I think, of, uh, of looking at these men. Now, speaking again of George Whitfield, mainly speaking of Whitfield here at the beginning, I'll give you a few quotations. Somebody put it like this. There are few men... Few men whose characters have suffered so much from ignorance and misrepresentations of the truth as George Whitfield. This is J.C. Ryle I'm, I'm speaking of now. He's saying this. Uh, he says that he was a famous Methodist and ally of John Wesley in the 18th century, that he was much run after by ignorant people for his preaching and was by many thought of, thought of as an enthusiast and fanatic all this is about as much as many know of him. So people have disparaged Whitfield, and, and until recently, really, in the great work of Dallamore and others, uh, he, he was seriously unknown by many who should have known better. But I've gone with, Whit, with um, Ryle's uh, quotation here. He says this, but that he was one of the principal champions of evangelical religion in the 18th century in our own country, that he was one of the most powerful and effective preachers that ever lived, that he was a man of extraordinary singleness of eye and devoted to the interests of true religion, that he was a regularly ordained clergyman of the Church of England and would always have worked in the Church of England if the Church had not most unwisely shut him out. Of all these things people seem aware seem unaware rather and yet after calm examination of his life and writings I am satisfied that this is the true account that ought to be given of George Whitfield. Um, J.C. Ryle writes that in The New Birth. Another one said this, I don't know whether you agree with this but it's a strong uh, statement, he said in the history of preaching since the Apostles or the history of preaching since the Apostles does not contain a greater or worthier name than that of George Whitfield. Maybe that's slightly exaggerated, but just mention that because this man is undoubtedly, or was undoubtedly, a great man of God. And another quote was this, If a list could be made from the experience of all nations and ages of the 20 men that have produced the greatest effects, by means of their single personal influence, it is highly probable that the name of George Whitfield must there hold a place. That uh, was said by uh, John Foster in his famous critical essays. And here's one, here's one from Delamore. One would suppose that such a life would be treasured by the Christian world. It would be expected that this career, that his career would receive thorough research, that its documents would be carefully preserved and its story told and retold for all to read. Such would be the expectancy. But the treatment that Whitfield has received has been very much the opposite. During the years that followed his death, attitudes towards him are characterised by a strange carelessness. Precise investigation was largely lacking. The accusations made by his enemies were widely circulated. The great accomplishments of his life were gradually forgotten and his memory was allowed to sink into neglect. But in our day and age, certainly amongst Reformed evangelical 
Christians, uh, we've come to appreciate Whitfield more and more. Now, I tell you some facts that perhaps you already know, but I remind you of them. George Whitfield was born in, in Gloucester, 16th of December, 1714. He was the youngest child of Thomas and Elizabeth Whitfield. Whitfield's father died when he was young and his mother remarried. The second marriage proved uh, disastrous, is all you can say, and it culminated in a divorce, which was a very rare thing in those days. So you're talking about this young fellow's uh, early life being uh, quite, quite hard in many respects emotionally. Now, of course, we all know that uh, his parents owned the Bell in Gloucester, which is still there. It was a coffee shop the last time I saw it, but that was some years ago. And um, he was brought up in the atmosphere of a, of a public life. We might just uh, sketch some details of the conditions and the, the time of life, the, the period in which he was born. Just going back to J.C. Ryle for a minute, there is a, a very useful piece of advice given in regard to uh, looking at uh, characters in history. Uh, Ryle um, says, you know, it's very important when you, you're looking at a character and trying to assess that character that, that you uh, bear in mind the times in which they live, the, the influences, the, the norms, the atmosphere uh, of those times. I, I'll just read it to you. Ryle said, Conduct that in one kind of times may seem rash, extravagant, indiscreet, in other times may be wise, prudent and even absolutely necessary. Informing your opinion of the comparative merits of Christian men Never forget the old rule, distinguish between the times. Place yourself in each man's position. Do not judge what was a right course of action in other times by what seems a right course of action in your own times. So, there's a piece of advice there. Now, the times in which Whitfield were born were unquestionably very difficult spiritually. The 18th century, I think we mentioned it once before, was called, as has been called, the glacial epoch, glacial, the glacial, glacial epoch uh, of Christianity, certainly evangelical Christianity. A dark age, uh, indeed. There, there was, as is very well known really, very little gospel preaching in the established church. There's very little concern for spiritual matters amongst the general population. And we, we mentioned, I think just a few moments ago, a time when zeal for godliness looked as odd upon a man as the clothes of his great grandfather. There were some conscientious, you might say, diligent bishops within the established church at that time but very, very few of these really had an evangelical perspective, an evangelical heart, um, and certainly very little real concern for the mass of unchurched people that were all around them. Uh, again, quoting Ryle, he said, there may well, or, or that there were many well-read, respectable and honourable men among the parochial clergy of this period. It would be wrong to deny it, he says. But few, it is feared, out of the whole number, preach Christ crucified in simplicity and sincerity. Many whose lives were decent and moral, and mark this, many whose lives were decent and moral were notoriously Arians, if not Socinians. You know, uh, an Arian was a follower of Arius who said Christ was only a, uh, a super angelic being. And a Socinian was that as well, but also denied the doctrine of the Trinity mainly. The deity of Christ, the Socinian denied original sin, uh, depravity of man, uh, vicarious atonement, uh, future judgment and punishment of um, sinners. Uh, all that was denied uh, by the Socinians. Uh, and so that characteristic marked many of the ordinary Anglican clergyman of that time. Uh, not only so, we've all heard of the, the hunting 
fishing, shooting parsons of the day, and um, they they were there. Uh, Ryle calls them. Uh, Ryle, Ryle describes them, saying they hunted, they shot, they drank, they swore, they fiddled, they farmed, they toasted church and king, and thought little or nothing about saving souls. As for the man who dared to preach the doctrines of the Bible, he would be sure to be set down as an enthusiast, in, the, in a derogatory term, an enthusiast or a fanatic. And then you could move on to the state of the dissenters, the dissenting churches, and uh, they weren't really very much better. They, they'd enjoyed in uh, the time, the coming of William of Orange, 1689, the, the, the uh, time when they were allowed uh, by law to, to build their chapels and to worship and so on. It was a great uh, time, really, and, and, and in many ways it, it contributed in the end to the revival because um, they were able to receive the people and... Uh, there was a, a, a greater spirit of religious liberty in that sense. But the liberty on the negative side um, seemed to send them to sleep. It, it's well known, isn't it, that when churches are persecuted, they seem to thrive. And when they're let alone, um, they seem to just decline. Well, that was certainly the case in the early 18th century. You, you can go along with the Presbyterians who... Uh, to a large degree, gone into Unitarianism, and the, the, the Baptists and the Independents, they they did have their great champions like uh, Isaac Watts and uh, Doddridge, John Gill, and uh, and so on. But again, many of them just went into their own little shells at this particular time. Um, they weren't like their predecessors. Uh, they weren't like the John Owens or the, the Flavels or, or those other great uh, Puritan men uh, of the days uh, of the great ejection and before and so on. So they were very orthodox, as generally said, many of these people, but they were painfully cold, uh, they were conscientious, diligent in many ways, but th there was a spiritual deadness uh, about them. So, so th this is a sort of background, uh, but I think we've already said a, a fair bit about that. We, we've already mentioned the, the moral state uh, of those times, uh, total disregard really for the principles of morality. And we mentioned last time, I think, on, on, on the massive increase in sales of uh, gin, intoxicating liquors of all times, but chiefly cheap gin and the grog shops and uh, I had some figures here which I don't think I, I mentioned last time but in the period estimated in the period 1694 to 1734 the yearly uh, distillation of alcoholic liquor rose from 81,000 gallons to that of 6074 gallons thousand gallons I should say six oh seven four thousand gallons uh, and, and by 1750 the, the, this had, had risen oh by 11 million up to 11 million gallons per annum so so the tremendous drunkenness and the debauchery going on I think I mentioned the famous Mohawks club that distinguished themselves uh, by flattening their victims' noses, uh, pushing their nose into their face and even gouging people's eyes out. So it was a very bad day. So that's something of the, of the background. Now, let's go back to George Whitfield's early life. 1714 was the date of his uh, birth. Uh, like many great men, his uh, origins were, were humble, as we said. Um, born in a public house, uh, his mother suffered something like 14 weeks sickness after, after his birth. I think he nearly killed her in birth. Uh, but she said that she expected more comfort from him as he grew up uh, than all her other children. Now, he had very little spiritual teaching or influence in the home. Uh, in, w in which he was brought up and, and he says himself uh, 
that uh, in his, his early days, his childhood and early teens, um, he was addicted to, as he says, lying, filthy talking and foolish jesting. Uh, he says that he'd been a Sabbath breaker, a theatre goer, a card player, a romance reader. Uh, and, and all this was going on, in, as he says, in, in the years between being about 12 and 15. So he, he, he grows up very quickly in this harsh, rough sort of environment. And he must have become very sort of worldly wise uh, in that period. But when he was 12, he was sent to the grammar school at Gloucester. And um, he didn't do particularly well at school. He didn't seem to have had uh, a great deal of uh, interest in it. But uh, it was pointed out by the schoolmasters and so on of the time that he had um, developed a very remarkable, good elocution. Uh, he spoke tremendously clearly and confidently and uh, had a, a tremendous memory. And apparently when any special occasion came and, and a pupil had to say a few words or something, uh, Whit Whitfield was your man. Uh, and so he, he was used to that sort of thing, all in the providence of God. Anyway, by the time he gets to 15, he's absolutely fed up with school. He doesn't really want uh, anything much more to do with it. And... Um, uh, he leaves school and, and begins to work, as we would say these days, full time in the public house. He put it like this. He said, uh, I put on my blue apron, washed mops, cleaned rooms, and in one word became a professional drawer of ale for nigh a year and a half. So it, it seemed as if, uh, though he was clever and had the great ability, he, he would just disappear uh, it, it, into the life uh, of a publican and so on. And it's at this time that this great crisis is taking place when Whitfield's mother l l uh, divorces, as it were, her second husband, not Whitfield's father, this other fellow. And you, you, you can imagine the tension and, and the anger and the outbursts that's going on in this, uh, in, in this place. Uh, Whit Whitfield said at that time he was spending his time drawing ale for drunkards. So it, it's a most inconducive atmosphere, totally alien to, to what was to happen in the, in the rest of his life. But again, you see the Lord's hand uh, upon him. And, and a friend, I, I don't know who this friend was, but this friend, uh, I, I believe, had already begun uh, at, at university. And um, it, it, this sparked something, the, the friends talking of university and perhaps Whitfield being aware of the way this young, other young fellow was getting on in life and doing something useful and comparing it with what he was doing stirred his spirits. And so when he was 18 years of old, he, um, he enrolled as a, as a servitor uh, at Oxford University. Uh, Pembroke uh, College it was that he, he went to. Um, a servitor, you'll know well, was somebody who couldn't really afford to pay the fees, but uh, worked his passage by uh, serving other students, waiting on tables, lighting their fires, running their errands, etc. He, he was the, the lowest of the low uh, in that category uh, of students. And he says himself, he was very lonely, felt very isolated, um, he, he, he must have stood out like a sore thumb, as it were, amongst the, 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 the usual fellows that were there at university in those days. This fellow from a uh, public house and uh, a broken home and little education and all, all the rest of it. Though he must have been clever enough to get there, uh, I, I say, but he must have felt inadequate uh, and substandard uh, amongst the people that were there. Now... At this time, of course, the famous Holy Club was meeting at uh, Oxford. Now, Whitfield couldn't go to that. He, he was a mere servitor. The class distinctions of that day meant people like that weren't allowed to join the various clubs and, and societies that were part of university life. They, they, they didn't fit in, they weren't wanted. But uh, apparently, uh, though he... He knew about it and he longed to be part of this. There's a spiritual hunger developing in his life. He, he, he's, he begins to watch these men and begins to admire these men. And he wants to be part of it, but he can't. Until Charles Wesley, 
keeping his eyes open, as we all should, uh, sees this man Whitfield, this young fellow, and uh, against all the rules, breaking all the rules, I'm not advocating breaking rules, but there are sometimes rules that need breaking, uh, he invited him along to the Holy Club and, and, and he came along. And uh, immediately sort of he, he warms to this atmosphere and begins to thrive uh, in it. Now, we, we have to say of the Holy Club, again, as you'll know, it, in many respects it was uh, desperately lacking real evangelical light. Um, the, these men who came along came out of this Anglican church that we've just described uh, that even in the best places was no more than salvation by works and so on. Moralistic, legalistic, no, no gospel element uh, to speak of at all. And um, people describe this, um, that the, the, they, they would say they believed in the doctrine of justification by faith, but then they define faith uh, 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 as, you, you know, doing good deeds, doing good works. Um, some of this uh, uh, developed, as I think we mentioned in the last uh, essay, in the last lecture, from men like Jeremy Taylor. Uh, I, I give you a quote here. Jeremy Taylor um, said this, Through the cross, Christ has brought down the market, that is, has made it possible to find salvation through a devotion that is not flawless. I'll say that again. Jeremy Taylor said, through the cross, Christ has brought down the market, that is, has made it possible to find salvation through a devotion that is not flawless. In, o in other words, Christ has made it easier for us to uh, earn salvation by our works. Our works, not good works, not being perfect, but Christ has made them acceptable. He, he goes on and says, um, or people have made this comment about it, I should say, the effect of Christ's death was thus to rehabilitate self-righteousness. And th th this was the sort of thing that the members of the Holy Club were doing. They were seeking to follow that pattern and try and earn their salvation by visiting prisons, and by helping widows and orphans and saying long prayers and all this sort of thing. They were trying to do their best, as we might say, but they were, they were adrift. Well, Whitfield finds himself um, in, this, in this group. Now... At the same time that all this was going on, uh, there's a book that comes, appears as it were, by the grace of God, amongst the members of this group. Somebody finds it somewhere and starts to read it and tell the others about it. And, and this, of course, was uh, Henry Skugel, Henry Skugel, S-C-O-U-G-A-L, S-C-O-U-G-A-L, book, The Life of God. In the soul of man. I would think it was be still in print. And that began to circulate, as did Baxter's call to the unconverted, as did Elaine's alarm to unconverted sinners. They got hold of these books. They were interested in spiritual books, you see. And in the providence of God, these books began to circulate. And um, Whitfield it seems to have been the first amongst this group to experience true conversion. And eventually, by 1736, uh, he, he is the leader of it. He wasn't allowed to go there in the first place, but he does, and uh, he becomes the leader. By this time, John Wesley, who had been the leader, at one time Charles Wesley was the leader because John Wesley was away somewhere, but he comes back, he's the leader, but by now... Um, he has gone to Georgia, America, as we mentioned in the previous lecture. And so Whitfield, for a while, is the, is the leader of the group. And uh, Whitfield goes on to complete his uh, degree and is, is ordained into the Church of England. That was his desire. Uh, 
and he preached his first sermon in St. Mary the the Crypt's Church in Gloucester, where he is reputed to have, uh, by the preaching of his first sermon, driven 15 people mad. We'd all like to know what that madness was, and no doubt it was a derogatory way of saying they were converted. But he moved from there to take up uh, a temporary appointment uh, at the Tower Chapel, London, and was immediately uh, became a very, not only an acceptable preacher, but a very popular preacher. And um, the place began to attract large numbers of people. And it said that wherever he preached, the churches were, were, were not crowded. They, they were crammed, as they said in those uh, the, the accounts, to the point of suffocation. Uh, one eyewitness is supposed to have said that the churches were so full that it would have been possible to walk over the people's heads. Now, <laughs> that's, that, that's just, uh, this is a young fellow who's had no real background till he gets to Oxford and the Holy Club, and then it was very imperfect. Uh, but this man has been so taken hold of by the Holy Spirit that uh, uh, and such is a movement here in, in, in this ungodly age that we've tried to describe and emphasize that people now are crowding in uh, to the point of suffocation uh, the churches where he is uh, preaching. So this goes on um, although um, the, the people at the Tower Church can't put up with it and eventually he's, he, he's moved on from there and um, it's at this point that uh, Whitfield makes his first trip across the Atlantic, again, to Georgia. Um, he, he's going there to assist the Wesleys in the care of the orphan house, which had been uh, set up there, a place uh, where orphans were looked after. And uh, eventually, um, Whitfield becomes the man in charge and responsible for the work of the orphan house. Now, now, this wasn't really up Whitfield's street. It wasn't his way, it wasn't his calling, it wasn't his thing. But um, he, he does do that for, for some time. And people say that uh, the burden that he had of raising the money to keep all this going really uh, played upon his mind. There were about uh, 40 children and uh, f- full-time resident in the orphan house and every day there would be some of the region about a hundred children from poor families or whatever uh, that would come there uh, looking for food and, and and he had to sort of see to all this and, and arrange all this and um, e- even later on when he became a, a, a full-time preacher as it were he still had the responsibility of raising money for the for the orphan house and, and uh, it weighed on his mind, as I say, and at one point the orphan, ha- the orphan house uh, ran into debt and uh, he was responsible and the, it got very close to him being thrown into prison, a debtor's prison, uh, because he couldn't pay, pay for it. But at, just at that point, um, somebody in Scotland left a huge legacy and said that the orphan house uh, was, to, was to have it all. And it was huge, I don't know how much it was, but it, it relieved him uh, of that burden. So I'll come back to that later on. But um, so he, he went through all that. 1737, we're in the early days here, but 1737, um, he published his first sermon. And uh, the, na- the, na- the title of the sermon was The Nature and Necessity of Our Regeneration, Our New Birth, in Jesus Christ, the nature and necessity of our regeneration, our new birth in Jesus Christ. And that, that of course, was to set the tone of the rest of his life, the theme of his sermons, uh, as as it was also to set the tone of the the revival. That was the message uh, of the 18th century revival. And we all know well that uh, in preaching, Whitfield was uh, would employ very vivid um, illustrations of what he was talking about. We we sometimes forget that um, a lot of these illustrations and comparisons and stories perhaps um, have been edited out of these men's sermons. Um, 
edited out by other people. In the case of Wesley's sermons, he edited them out himself. So sometimes when you're reading these sermons, you say, oh, they don't sound that, that brilliant, you know, not that interesting. But you have to remember a lot, a lot of it's been tampered with to some degree. Um, and then we mustn't forget, of course, these men were preaching in the power and the unction and with the authority of the Holy Spirit. And that had something to do with it. But um, just to give one example of the sort of thing that Whitfield would do in his, uh, in his sermons. I, I, I'll read this. I, I, this is a quote from somebody commenting on Whitfield's sermons. And um, on one occasion, he was asking his hearers, his congregation, to, uh, to, to imagine being in heaven. And this is what he said. Lift up your hearts frequently towards the mansions of eternal bliss. And with an eye of faith, like the great Stephen, see the heavens opened. Do that. And the Son of Man, see the Son of Man like Stephen with this glorious, with his glorious retinue of departed saints sitting and solacing themselves in eternal joys. And with unspeakable comfort, looking back on their past sufferings and self-denials, so many glorious means which exalted them to such a crown. Hark, methinks. I hear that chanting. I hear them chanting their everlasting alleluias. Ah, listen. I hear them. I see them spending an eternal day and echoing forth their triumphant songs of joy. And do you not long, my brethren, to join this heavenly choir? Now, I read it, it very dramatic, but uh, you imagine him setting the scene of this vast throng of eager expectant hearers and listeners to the Holy Spirit on him and brooding over that congregation. Well, anyway, eventually um, he finds uh, on his return to England many of the churches that he'd known now close to him, close to him. And uh, so it, it, it's, it's at this point where he begins to uh, consider and indeed practice outdoor outdoor preaching. Spurgeon said this of him, it was a brave day for England when Whitfield began field preaching. And remember, field preaching had been pioneered by those uh, Welsh preachers like Howell Harris and so on. So uh, this was new to England, but Whitfield was, as we said earlier, first in the field. He'd been in correspondence with Howell Harris uh, at this particular time. And he saw it uh, as, a, as a real means of, of reaching the, the vast unchurched multitudes of his day and generation and without being cumbered, and without having to go to all the trouble of trying to coach and cajole various vicars and church wardens and so on to, to allow him to use the building. Uh, and then to be promised it and then at the, to arrive and find the door locked and all this sort of thing. He didn't have to worry about meeting rooms and all the expense and hassle of that. Just go out uh, into the open air or wherever you can find a space and preach. And this is, this is what he did. Nobody could oppose him. England was a free country in that sense. That's where we, we hark back to the uh, time of, the, uh, uh, of William of Orange and so on and the liberty given. Uh, to, to free churches and so on. So anyway, the issue that seems to have decided Whitfield's course of action, of going forward into the open air, is as follows. He'd gone to Islington, London, to preach for um, a friend of his, uh, a vicar, uh, a Mr Stonehouse. It was April. And uh, he, was, he, he was in the church and he, he was conducting the, the prayers, which would have been out of the Book of Common Prayer and so on, he was going through the Church of England service, when the church warden came up towards him, up the aisle or whatever he did, uh, and uh, interrupted him and asked to see his licence to preach uh, in the London Diocese, the Diocese of London. Imagine that. Whitfield did never crossed his mind that you needed such licenses it just never entered his mind in any way uh, 
Uh, anyway, uh, the upshot of the matter was that he was forbidden to preach that day in the pulpit. So he didn't make a fuss about it, but he came down from the pulpit and somebody else, maybe the vicar, carried on and so on. But when the service was over, he went out into the churchyard and began to preach. And great was the movement of the Spirit on that day. And so from that point on, the fields uh, around, in and around London, the great open spaces, the great parks, the great commons, um, they were the places where Whitfield lifted up his voice to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Moor fields, Hackney fields, Mary Le Bone fields, Mayfair, Smithfield, Kennington Common, Blackheath, Sunday after Sunday. Uh, saw those vast, vast crowds, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 30,000 even on some occasions, heard him at once. What a voice he had. What an elocution. What an anointing of the spirit. And um, God bless it, as we know well. And um, these things were going on. Uh, on the negative side, even more church doors were closed to him. But the more they closed the doors, the more he preached in, in the open air. Come back to Ryle. He says this. <clears throat> From the time of his first going into the open air to the day of his death. A period of 31 years. Whitfield's life was one of constant busyness. From Sunday morning to Saturday night. Hear that. From Sunday morning to Saturday night, from the 1st of January to the 31st of December, except when he laid aside by illness, he was almost incessantly preaching. Imagine that. So some people have wondered how on earth he could keep it up. I'll tell you how many times he preached a week in a minute. The only break that he got that he got and I remember Dr Masters teaching us this all I don't know how long ago it was 30 40 years ago he said the only breaks these men got was when they were crossing the Atlantic then they had a period uh, of, of, of some kind of relief from it but when you think of those storms and those Atlantic crossings it wasn't very comfortable but maybe that was the relief but I go on with Ryle there was hardly a considerable town in England, Scotland and Wales that he didn't visit. Think of that, travelling. Travelling was not easy in those days. When churches were open to him, he gladly preached in churches. When chapels were offered, he cheerfully preached in chapels. When church and chapel alike were closed, he was ready and willing to preach in the open air. For 34 years he laboured in this way, always proclaiming the same glorious gospel and always, as far as man's eye can judge, with immense effect. In one single Whitsuntide week, after he had been preaching in Moorfield, he received, hear this, 1,000 letters from people under spiritual concern and admitted to the Lord's table 350 persons. In the 34 years of his ministry, it is reckoned that he preached publicly 18 thousand times imagine a thousand letters just reading them and what about responding them to them maybe he had helpers i don't know but it was a massive task just to do that 14 times he visited scotland seven times he crossed the atlantic backward and forward once he traveled to bermuda he also travelled to Holland. Twice he went over to Ireland. As to England and Wales, he travelled in every county in them, from the Isle of Wight to Berwick-on-Tweed and from Land's End to the North Foreland. He goes on. Likewise, his regular ministerial work in London. <laughs> All this time, he, he's got a regular Lord's Day ministry. Likewise, his regular ministerial work in London, when he was not journeying, was also immense. His weekly, hear this, his weekly engagements at the tabernacle in Tottenham Court Road, which was built for him when the pulpits of the established church were close to him, were as follows. This is his week's schedule. 
Every Sunday morning he administered the Lord's Supper for several hundred communicants at half past six. What time did he get up? Several hundred communicants, the Lord's Supper. After this, he read prayers and preached both morning and afternoon. He preached again in the evening at half past five and concluded by addressing a wide society of widows, married people, young men and spinsters, all sitting separately in the area of the tabernacle with exhortations suitable to their respective stations. So from half past six in the morning, right through to the end of the day, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, he was ministering. <coughs> How? Without the help of the Holy Spirit, did the man keep it up? Some of us sometimes preach three times on the Lord's Day. But we're exhausted after it. This man had that special anointing. But we haven't finished yet. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday mornings, he preached regularly at 6 a.m. On Monday... Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday evenings, he gave lectures. He made 13 sermons a week. This made 13 sermons a week. <laughs> we find it hard to preach three. At the same time, he was carrying on correspondence with people in almost every part of the world, says Ryle that any human frame could so long endure the labour he went through does indeed seem wonderful. That his life was not shortened by violence is no less wonderful. Once he was nearly stoned to, de to death by a popish mob in Dublin. Once he was nearly murdered in bed by an angry lieutenant of the Navy at Plymouth. Once he narrowly escaped being stabbed by a sword of an immoral young gentleman in more fields. It's dangerous stuff. When you've got a crowd of 10, 20, 30,000 people, you don't know who's amongst them. But he was immortal till his work was done. Well, that's true of us all. He died at last, as we know, in Newburyport, North America, from a fit of asthma at the age of 56. His last sermon was preached only 24 hours before his death. And that was in the open air, an open air discourse of two hours long. He did, he did speak to the people in the house at Newbury Report before he went upstairs to die. We know that. In one way, that was his last sermon. Like Bishop Jewell in the time of the Reformation, he almost died preaching. He left no children. He, he did have a child, died at the age of, I think, about six Ryle says, never, I believe, was there a man of whom it could be so truly said that he spent and was spent for God. Well, you could certainly say that. This was a man that pushed himself, drove himself. It's said of him that when, when he had preached to one of these vast crowds for, for an hour or more, Usually, afterwards, I, I don't want to be crude, but it was said of him that the usual, usual thing after that, there was a, a vast discharge from his stomach, usually with blood in it. He gave his whole frame, his whole being, every ounce of energy was in what he did uh, to 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 preach to a large crowd as you know we if we have a large crowd of say a thousand we're exhausted after it and it's not very often we have that but when you've got ten thousand people outside and the, in some ways they're, they're a mob and you don't know what they're going to do and uh, as we know well they throw things at you and so on dead cats and sods of earth and worse bricks in some occasion uh, and, and um, you know you're projecting your voice and and you, you're speaking extemporary your mind is, is exhausted the pressure on you must have been tremendous this is what this man was doing all the time 
Now, Whitfield became a close friend in, in, the, in America of um, Benjamin Franklin, the, the famous American statesman and scientist as well, and writer. One of the men who uh, drafted out the American Declaration of Independence in 1776. It was an unusual friendship in many ways because um, these men, they, they weren't of one mind, certainly spiritually. Um, Franklin's religion was, was very much of the good works type that we've been uh, discussing and thinking about earlier. Uh, whereas Whitfield, you know, his emphasis is on free grace, Justification by faith, and so on. Um, but but they they were great friends, and it just shows you, you know you you can do that. And it was Benjamin Franklin that uh, uh, published an, uh, an edition of Whitfield's journals and some of his sermons. But this is why I mention this. Franklin once estimated that Whitfield could, without any amplification, be heard by a crowd of more than. 30,000 people. He, he could easily do that. Well, I say easily. He could do it with, with what the demands were on him to do it. We've just been thinking about. During his lifetime, others have estimated that Whitfield must have uh, addressed in the region of 10 million people. He was attacked from all quarters, <laughs> needless to say. There were sort of songs, rude, ribald songs um, were sung about him sort of thing. Uh, he, he was the butt of a, a, a satirical play. Um, on the other hand, he was honoured by uh, various people. Uh, Charles Wesley wrote a poem about him and you, you'll find that in Dallimore, uh, William Cooper or Cowper wrote a poem about him, as did the American Quaker, John Greenleaf Whittier. Um, I, I, it, that's a massive poem, Whittier's poem. I, I, I made a copy of it here. Uh, it's covering, as you, as you can see, several pages. It's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven and a half pages. And um, it's very interesting. There's some very wonderful... Uh, lines in it. Um, one, one of the verses is about um, Whitfield's burial in the, um, in the church at Newbury Port and uh, I, I just read a, a, li a little tiny bit of it. It says, uh, a while my friend with rapid search or ran the landscape yonder spire, there's the spire of Newbury Church, over grey roofs a shaft of fire. What is it pray? The Whitfield Church. Walled about by its basement stones, there rests the marvellous prophet's bones. Then as our homeward way we walk, of the great preacher's life we talk, and through the mystery of our theme the outward glory seems to stream, and nature self-interpreted the doubtful record of the deed, and every level beam that smote the sails upon that dark afloat. A symbol of the light became, which touched the shadows of our blame with tongues of Pentecostal flame. That uh, great anointing of the uh, spirit that was on him. And um, other verses. Well, these are all in uh, Dallimore, if you don't want to run it down from the, uh, from the internet, which you can. I um, wanted to just pick up on uh, another bit. Where this, I just lost the bit where it's talking about it that I wanted to mention. Ah, yes. I can't see where it is, but I'll just read this bit. Um, when Whitfield preached, the trembling hand of the world wind, the trembling hand of the worldling shook, the dust of years from the holy book, and the psalms of David forgotten long, took the place of the scoffer's song. The impulse spread like the outward course of waters moved by a central force. The tide of spiritual life rolled down from inland mountains to seaboard town. 
Well, that's that. But uh, another reason why I mention uh, this poem by uh, John Greenleaf Whit- Whittier, which has these some tremendous uh, lines in it, if you if you if you look them up, if you can find them quicker than I can. Um, there's also a verse in it that, that is a bit critical of Whitfield. And I, I mention this because uh, in this day and age, somebody's bound to bring it up somewhere. I don't mean from my present uh, listeners, but I mean some of the people you speak to about Whitfield who are not so uh, favourable towards him. And it would be the fact that uh, sometimes people say Whitcliffe kept slaves. Well... We say this, and, and it's very well uh, talked about, again, in Dallimore's life of Whitfield. It's true, to some degree, that the slaves were involved with Whitfield. What happened was, we mentioned the, uh, the orphan house uh, there in Georgia, which uh, was always short of money. And some very kind soul um, said that they could have the, uh, some of the revenues from... Um, a plantation in in um, Carolina, and uh, Whitfield was desperate to get money from somewhere, and he he accepted it, he accepted the money. But the point was, the um, the estate or the plantation in Carolina was was worked by slaves. So by implication, uh, that's where this uh, this accusation comes from. But then on the other hand. Whitfield was very bothered about this because even before this time and after it, he'd given a considerable amount of his time to um, criticising the slave trade and seeking better conditions for the slaves. And even though we may say he, he didn't do the right thing in accepting the money from the Carolina estate, he did ensure that the conditions of those slaves that worked on that estate were, were better than any ordinary workman would have had. Their, their conditions were in every way very good, apart from the fact that they were still slaves. So Whitfield was certainly against slavery, but he, he weakened, as it were, because he had another problem of how to feed all these un- hungry children uh, in, the, in the orphan house. But you, you can read all about that uh, in, um, in um, Dalimore's life. Uh, of Whitfield. So when you hear these things, there's always another side to the story. And um, also, we might just uh, say, time is almost run out. People make a great deal of the arguments that he had at the middle of uh, the course of the revival with, with John Wesley and how they called each other some pretty terrible names and it was very full of animosity. Well, that's true. You can't deny it. And the devil works in these ways. But, of course, uh, I also have here the famous uh, funeral sermon that was preached by Mr John Wesley uh, on the occasion of Whitfield's death. The sermon uh, number 53 in Wesley's sermons entitled On the Death of the Reverend George Whitfield. And the text is from Numbers 23, verse 10. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his and if there was animosity in the middle period there certainly was no animosity in the end period and we mustn't make too much of these divisions between uh, Christian peoples uh, under the pressure of uh, the ministry and all the other things so uh, if you if you read uh, Wesley's funeral sermon on George Whitfield you'll get a blessing and you'll see things in a, in a, in a very different light. And um, not only that, but Wesley wrote a hymn about him. And I'll just read that uh, one verse, and then our, our, it's pretty well up. He said this, begins like this. Servant of God, well done. Thy glorious warfare's past. The battle's fought, the race is won. And thou art crowned at last of all thy heart's desire, triumphantly possessed, lodged by the ministerial choir in thy Redeemer's breast. Redeemed from earth and pain, ah, when shall we ascend and all in Jesus' presence reign with our translated friend? Come, Lord, and quickly come, 
And when in thee complete, receive thy longing servants home to triumph at thy feet. Well, that's just a little brief sketch of the life of the Reverend George Whitfield and all that God accomplished through that great and good man. May God bless all. Let us pray. And so, Lord, as again we've looked at thy works of old and seen thy mighty servants of a former day, we pray, Lord, that we may seek to emulate them as followers of our Saviour Jesus Christ and learn their lessons from their lessons that are inspire us and those things that they did that were not right and help us to avoid them. And pray, Lord, that we may have such in our own day and use us, poor as we are, to thy praise and glory and revive thy work. Pardon all our sins, for Jesus' sake. Amen.